we're at the all-time low in terms of resilience. The reason is that we have less and less physical close relationship with others. Uh, just think about when you get to talk to friends, how many topics are we, are we not talking? There was a story, American men are more likely to talk about challenges with erections and Viagra than about credit card debt. <laughs> The one and only Dan Ariely, the author of three New York Times bestsellers. An explosion that burned over 75% of Dan's body was the catalyst for him to become a world leader in behavioral economics. I run my life looking at where are we underperforming on our human potential, how we spend our time and our money. The biggest place I think where we could do so much better and we're really terrible on is... Welcome back to the Loaf Podcast, everybody. We're very lucky today to be joined by the one and only Dan Ariely, a behavioral economist famous for examining the quirks in the human psyche, especially with regards to irrationality. One experiment he conducted had participants try to remember the Ten Commandments before a test, and it made them less likely to cheat compared to a control group who did random memory tests. His new, belief, his new book, Misbelief, is now out, and it looks at the way in which rational people come to believe completely irrational things. Dan, so, thanks so much for coming on today. We're really excited to have you. How are you? My pleasure. Very, very well. Uh, what have you been up to lately? Actually, no, the, the answer, I'm very, very well, is a kind of instinctive answer, and it's not a, a true reflection on uh, how I feel uh, now that I... I realized it. So, um, you know, October 7th, the war broke in the south of Israel. Uh, so I went to Israel. Um, I was there until two days ago. Um, and it's a very, very, very tough times. Um, you know, the it, it brings up so, so many questions and the emotional turmoil uh, throughout the day, I, I don't think I've experienced such a sequence of a, a complex, quick emotions that are that are changing um, so much, and um, very also much much harder to stay optimistic about the future with what's what's happening. Yeah, um, well, we're very sorry to to hear that. We hope that um, yeah. you're safe and and that your family. Is safe and obviously our heart goes out to innocent lives that are being lost and yeah we do have this duality you know when I was when I was in Israel I was dealing only with what's going on uh, trying to figure out how to diagnose kids and, and adults and so on but now that I'm in the state I live this dual life and I guess we'll we'll basically uh, continue this these thoughts about the tragedies are in the background, but we'll we'll talk about other things, I guess. Yeah, I, I guess that that's really how it is sometimes to to keep remembering that. But I guess to a certain extent, maybe there's nothing you can do right right now or we can do right now. So, um, but yeah, thanks thanks for joining us today. So Dan, just to bring it on slightly out of tune, but just to bring it on to a slightly lighter note, because this is how we like to begin our episodes with all our guests, as you know, with a loaf podcast. And so, hoping to find a little something out about you. What's your favorite bread? My favorite bread, I think it's this uh, heavy Swedish dark bread. Do you know this? Uh, I don't. Uh, That's a unique answer. Okay. We tend to get sourdough. So <laughs> it's good. Original. Okay. I like it. <laughs> but yeah, so you released your book, Misbelief, very recently. I believe in September just gone. Um, and yep. I want you to tell us a little bit about the journey of coming to want to write about this, particularly with beliefs surrounding COVID and all that sort of thing? So, um, you know, most of my books uh, came out of my research. So I did research first and then I said, okay, let me just describe this in a general way. I think it could be useful and so on. Uh, this book was very different. And, and the background story is that uh, I tried to roll back the time and think to the beginning of COVID. Um, and I feel I'm at the top of my academic career. And, and the reason is that uh, all the challenges that, that became clear, uh, people need some help from social scientists. 
And if you think about it, there are questions about distant education and work remotely and releasing prisoners and domestic violence and how to get people to wear masks and fines and, you know, just, just a number of questions were incredible. How to pay people on furlough. So I, um, I sit there and I do nothing but try to help. I get questions from all over the world and I try to help. <clears throat> and this goes on for a while. And then at some point in July, I get an email from somebody I once helped, but I didn't know her very well. And she said, Dan, what happened to you? How have you changed? I said, what happened? How have I changed? And she sent me a long list of links. I'll just give you a description of one of them. In that, in that link, uh, it shows pictures of me from my early days in hospital. So as you, as you know, I was, I was badly burned. Most of my body was covered. This is why I have half a beard, right? This side is burned. There's no, there's no hair. This side, I'm not shaving, so there's hair. Um, it almost looks symmetrical, but not really. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, so there's there's a there's a video that shows me in hospital, and it says I was burned seventy percent of my body, three years in hospital. That's all true. But then it goes on to say that uh, because of that, um, I started hating healthy people, and that's why I joined the cabal and Bill Gates and the Illuminati to try and kill as many healthy people as possible, and that's what the pandemic is all about and that's there was no vaccine at the time but they already predicted that that's what the vaccine uh, would do uh, anyway there were many other uh, many other videos uh, like that uh, people thought i am trying to slow down the health authority so that more people all kinds of things um anyway i i all of a sudden got exposed to this other reality and uh, my first instinct was to contact these people that were accusing me of all kinds of things and tell them, no, that's just not true. But then I thought better of it, and I uh, consulted some PR experts. And they all had the same advice. They say, don't touch it. Don't talk to them. Don't touch it. Or this. Um, anyway, I was very proud. I contacted them to talk, but I was unable to follow their advice. Uh, just imagine somebody... Uh, have this opinion about you, it's very, very tough to basically yeah, it's, not... It's, it's disturbing, yeah. So I called some people that accused me. I invited some of them to come and have coffee with me. I joined uh, calls. I joined channels on Telegram. I joined podcasts, all kinds of things. And let me tell you, the PR experts were right. I did absolutely no good, and I mostly did damage uh, to myself. Um, and it was a very tough month because I also, uh, people got more and more involved. I started getting death threats. Uh, by the way, the last one I got was like 10 days ago. So it, it used to be once a day. Now it's every 10 days or so. <clears throat> um, but then after a month of failure, I stopped. Slow learner, but I do learn. And uh, I took a step back and I started trying to understand uh, their world. Because, you know, we, we all heard about all kinds of strange beliefs, right? Let's say the, the earth is flat. Um, but, but it's one thing to think about somebody who believes that, and it's another thing to talk to somebody who says, I know something about you that you don't know. And you're just trying to, to defend yourself. And you give them all the information. Imagine I said, Lucas, I, I heard that uh, uh, you last week um, uh, physically uh, abused Ollie. And, and no matter what you say, I would say, no, it's just true. Like, why aren't you just admitting it? You know, no matter what, I wasn't, we, we didn't meet, we were not in the, same, in the same city, you know, whatever you say, here's my calendar, and I, I, I'm documented, like, it doesn't really matter. So it's very troubling about human nature, not just about these people, to say, how can somebody hold a belief about me that no matter what I say and what this, that I can't convince them uh, on anything like that. So I, I spent the next two years trying to understand um, this process. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I think most people have somebody in their lives that Five years ago, you say, me and this other person see the world eye to eye. <clears throat> we have the same view. We have the same perspective. 
we understand things in the same way. And now you look at that person and you say, I don't know where they're coming from. Are we the same species of humanity? Like how, how are they processing information? And this book is basically saying they are just like us. These people that have developed these beliefs should not be discounted. Their ideals should not be discounted. What we need to understand that their beliefs, while very damaging and sad and, and unproductive and, and destructive to society, are a real response to a need. These people have a need for something, and this need is answered by these misbeliefs. And then, of course, it gets worse and worse and worse, and social media and so on. But, but the beginning is that these misbeliefs are not for nothing. They're actually a real, a real response to a real need, not, not a very good response. A bit like an autoimmune response, right? It's not a response you would want, but it's a response. I'll, I'll give you just... <clears throat> and, and there was one night, so I, t I talked to lots of them, and, and there's about 20 misbelievers, like very serious people, leading uh, lots of communities that I, uh, that I talk to quite often. And again, completely gave up on trying to help to get them to change their view about me, just talking to them about their view of the world. And one, one night I realized with, with one of them that she actually has a very difficult life. Uh, imagine you believe in God. If you believe in God, you wake up in the morning and you think the world is basically a good place. There's a good entity that keeps, keeps me safe and does all kinds of wonderful things. And yes, there's a devil from time to time, but mostly it's good. But if you believe that there's a cabal who is trying to plant a G5 chip into the vaccine and you know, um, uh, destroy the fertility of you and your kids, that's a terrible way to live. Right? That's just you you I, I started feeling sorry for, for that. That nobody would choose that life. Right? Nobody would choose that. Okay, so that's that's the story and and, um, <laughs> and that's why you wrote your book. And that's why I wrote my book. Now I will say that when I started writing it and I gave the publisher a proposal, uh, I had a chapter in there on solutions. But but as I was writing the book and trying to think about solutions, I realized I don't have solutions. Uh, throughout the book, I have little sections called Hopefully Helpful uh, because, because I wanted to, to approach this idea of solutions with, with the needed modesty. There's no one solution. <clears throat> this is a real problem. And as a metaphor, think about the obesity epidemic. Uh, think about the cookie. The cookie is like a weaponized food that is designed to attack our sense of taste and smell. The optimal combination of sugar, fat, and salt to get us to want one and then to want another one and another one and another one, creating a lot of negative consequences. Now, I don't think people in the cookie industry design the cookie this way to create the obesity epidemic, but they certainly design it to get us to want to eat cookies. In the same way, we have a system that attacks almost all of our psychology. This, this book is, is a book that looks at almost every element of our psychology. We look at emotion and stress. We look at the cognitive processes. We look at personality. We look at the, the social element, including the, the, the social media. All of them, you look at it from this perspective, you say it's almost designed to lead us into misbeliefs. Uh, the powers, the, the, the system that we have created is very damaging. And it's damaging for the individual, of course, but it's also damaging for society. Right? The, moment, the moment we go down the path of misbelief, um, I call it the funnel of misbelief because I also want to, to indicate how difficult it is to escape in the later stages. Much easier to escape in the early stages, difficult to escape in the later stages. Once we look at life from the perspective of misbelief, uh, lots of bad things come uh, with it. And, and just imagine we had COVID-23. Imagine that by the end of 23, we have, we have another version of COVID. How collaborative would people be? 
let's say uh, we get a, a request that if our kids wake up in the morning feeling sick with fever and coughing, not to send them to school. How many people would collaborate? Right? We, we have lost something very important in terms of trust. Not, not all of us, but as a society that is getting our collaborative effort to be much more difficult moving forward. Yeah, I really want to ask you about the fact that you, you were beginning that solutions chapter because that was something, before you even mentioned that, I wanted to ask you about that, is that what people often like about your work is you kind of have the genetic side of things, i.e. talking about how it comes about, what influences, irrationality, etc. And then, for example, in Predictably Irrational, you go, well, here's a way we can try and remedy, if not solve, this bias. So yeah. what sort of things do you think can be helpful to remedy people in, in your hopefully helpful as opposed to solution yeah. section? So, 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 so the book, the, the funnel of misbelief is broken into four components. Emotion, stress, and the point there is that stress is the breeding ground for misbeliefs. And I don't mean the stress of saying, oh my goodness, I'm so busy, I don't know how I'll finish the day. I'm talking about the stress of saying, I don't understand the world. I don't understand how this is, how can this be going on, right? Um, I don't understand why I'm not getting my share. I don't understand why I got fired and other people don't. I don't understand why my company went bankrupt, why, why I got fired yeah, when other people don't. Like, th there's some big things I don't understand how the, how the, world, how the world is working. Um, uh, and by the way, now I think we're, we're, in a, we're in a very complex period in this in this regard that we just don't understand the world, right? Like think about the the war in in Gaza. Like, who is really fighting? Is is Iran is involved? Is Syria involved? Is Russia connected? Are we on the verge of a third world war? Is this is this a local <coughs> issue? Very very complex and unclear and frightening. So so that's the breeding ground. That's the breeding ground. Um, the second part we say is, is cognitive. The third part is personality. And the last one is social. So personality is a little hard to change. But, but let's start with, with the first component of stress. So look, when, when COVID rolls around, there's a lot of stress. And with some of it, we can't handle. Like some of it, we can't do anything about. But some of it, we could. Uh, for example, what instructions do we give people? Uh, do we tell people, every day I'll tell you what we'll do tomorrow? That's a very stress-inducing. Nobody knows how to, how to move forward. Um, do we tell people, there's nothing you can do? Very stress uh, invoked. Yeah. So, so there are things we can do in that regard. Uh, but, but there's also the question of resilience. If you think about what is the antidote to stress, the antidote to stress is resilience. And, and resilience, um, we're at the all-time low in terms of resilience. And, and the reason is that uh, we have less and less physical close relationship with others. By the way, men are worse at this than, than women. Um, COVID, of course, we were separated, so it was harder to create resilience. Uh, kids who didn't go to school lost a lot uh, from this perspective. But also think like identity politics is separating us. Uh, just think about when you get to talk to friends, what are the, how many topics are we, are we not talking about, not sharing? Um, and, and there's a lot of topics that people don't share. But, you know, for example, uh, there was a story, I think, in the Atlantic, that they said that American men um, are more likely to talk about challenges with erections and Viagra than about credit card debt. <laughs> if, somebody, if somebody is struggling with credit card debt, I, you would want them to ask for help and so on. And, and income inequality, by the way, is fraying resilience. The moment income inequality increases, even at the level of a neighborhood, uh, people are less likely to ask for help. Do you not think that people are becoming a bit more open in terms of what they talk about than, for example, in the 40s? Do you not think people are becoming a bit more open about things like sexuality and um, 
and with their friends the this idea of like men being closed up i feel has has changed a little bit so i'm just like to push back a little bit on that first of all feel free to push back but but no i don't think it's true uh, okay. i think we pretend it's true uh, okay. i think uh, especially in in the left we pretend we're more open but but i think the the openness is very limited to to specific topics i think the cancel culture taboo about uh, specific topics are very much um, present in fact we we see that uh, conversations with minorities uh, people are so much afraid to bring a few topics that the style of conversation is changing um mm. but 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 also remember if we talk about the 40s that men used to let's say work in a factory just to give a, a stereotype Yeah. And then they used to go to the bar with their friends. There was time with friends. In fact, uh, time with friends is a very, very low, low level. Uh, the, the nuclear family has increased a lot in terms of time. And, and you know, again, stereotypes, but the women who were not working spent time with their friends. <clears throat> If you look at the nuclear family now, um, uh, people are working Uh, longer hours it's not they they spend necessarily more quality time with their kids but but there's certainly less time with friends uh, now uh, most people uh, schedule time to meet with friends right it's not let's go after work and we'll so 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 yes even so so i think part of it is even when you get together with friends i think it's much more restricted than you realize i think we have the illusion of openness um but then the the other thing is that um we have fewer friends and less time with friends and and, and so on so 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 when we, that's why you know there's not one solution like one solution is to say how do we make stress how do we not increase stress with the way we communicate things and the way we plan things and and so on the other one is how do we build society that could deal better, better with stress and we haven't done well uh in that in that regard like just think about i don't know i don't know in, in uh, for you but do you have this thing called trigger warnings that professors do now yes. in classes mm -hmm. yes yes it's pretty now, big. very popular that, on like uh sorry i was just going to say they're very popular particularly on social media with any kind of content even flashing lights for epilepsy all that sort of thing they're very commonplace now yeah yeah so so epilepsy i understand right if somebody has uh, this but 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 you know lots of lots of uh, professors report that you can't bring complex topics for discussions anymore now now that that for me is a is a real reflection on low resilience like i uh, i would love i look i don't want anybody to 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 suffer any any violence but i think discussing topics that are very painful and complex i think is important uh, and and just the fact that we that that there there's a growing number of people um who have a really hard time handling uh complex topics i i'm not blaming the people but i'm saying we we are at a very different era in terms of that but anyway i don't want to um no i just wanted to jump in here because it's it's a very interesting topic and it's a very very topical one um this year kathleen stock came to speak at the oxford union she's um seen as a as a turf so um trans exclusionary radical feminist and there was this idea of no platforming her and it's interesting because i do think that no these complex topics should be addressed however i don't think that it's a bad thing to have a trigger warning i think if it's as simple as saying oh look we're going to be discussing rape and rape's a very sensitive topic so why wouldn't we maybe say the, this topic is going to touch on this very harsh or on a very like, extreme topic so just be warned it it has this content here i i don't think that necessarily means that somebody is not resilient if you know what i mean no if if you just warn if you just talk about the warning the, of course that doesn't mean anything but but if you look at the percentage of people who say i there's a topic that i can't get exposed myself to Uh, now now you you're saying so imagine imagine in the 40s just because you gave that number imagine in the 40s somebody said look we are going to talk about this very terrible topic called rape if you can't handle it leave the class how many people would have left the class and how many people are are leaving the class that, that i don't i don't have these numbers 
but but that's the thought. But anyway, going back to so so we talked about stress, and oh, let me just say one more thing about stress. The reason stress is the breeding ground for misbeliefs is that when people are stressed of the type, like Job, I don't know what's going on, I don't know why I'm punished, why things are not going well, people want an answer. People want a story. And not all stories are made equal. What stories do they most want? They want a story with a villain. So it's not my fault, it's somebody else's fault. Look, it's this, it's this person. It could be a person, it could be, you know, uh, it's, it's all the fault of the Muslim, Catholic, Jewish, uh, whatever. Um, it doesn't have to be a person, it could be, it could be a group of people. And you want a complex story. Now, that's, that's kind of strange, right? Why complex? Um, we, we think what, one of the things you're, you're doing on this podcast is you're trying to simplify things, uh, get the essence. Why, why do we think that people want a complex story? And the complex story here is because it gives people a sense of power and control. Imagine that I feel that I'm an underdog in society. Not only do I want a story, but I want a story with the villain, and I want a story that is complex, so I can come back and say, oh, you think you understand the world. No, no, no. Let me tell you, I, I'm the one who really understands. You're a sheep. I mean, they use all kinds of terms. But you don't understand the complexity of the world. You don't understand really what's happening. I truly, truly understand it. Just to say, sorry, it's like this idea of like subjective experience creating a cognitive dissonance wherein you cannot access somebody else's emotions, therefore you can never understand it. So how can you even begin to argue with them? And it's just taking this moral high ground um, through, through that argument. Yeah, you, you, let's, let's not call this cognitive dissonance. We'll come back to cognitive dissonance and we'll be a bit more precise okay. about what it means. But, but okay, okay. You, you're correct sorry. about the general, <laughs> the general idea. Okay. Um, okay, so... Then there's the cognitive part. In the cognitive part, there's all kinds of elements to it. One, of course, is just a choice of what media we want to watch. Right? If you're more right-leaning, you'll watch right media, you watch left media. You'll, if you use one of the platforms, they'll, choose, <laughs> they'll, they'll see what you're looking at and they'll help you choose what you want. So we get exposed to only a part of the world. But, but there's, there's worse things than that from a cognitive perspective. And one of them is called motivated reasoning. And motivated reasoning is the idea that we can take a fact and we can bend it to fit what we want it to mean. And it's a tremendous human skill <laughs> uh, to do that. We can, we can basically ignore, uh, ignore reality and uh, reinterpret things in the way that we, we want it to, to see it, right? Oh, we see this, oh, this doesn't really count so much. Or this, no, but this is because, you know, there's all kinds of stories we can tell. And then, and then the final thing is that we, we often have a very shallow understanding uh, of what is going on, but with very high confidence. So, so and, and that's, uh, I'll, I'll just focus on that one, but of course, all of them are interesting and important and there's something to do with that. And that one, I'll give you one example. Uh, the, the official term for it is the illusion of explanatory depth. So consider the following idea. I did this experiment. I went to people and I said, how much do you understand how a flush toilet works? You know, one of those things that you do this and the water comes out. And people say, I understand it quite well. On a scale from zero to 10, I, I'm great. I said, okay, luckily for you, uh, we have all the pieces of a flush toilet here. Please assemble. Uh, now, nobody is able to assemble it. But now you go to them and you say, now how well do you understand how a flush toilet works? And people say, not so much. Now, if you think about it, usually when we try to argue with people, we, we bring evidence. We come at the other side, like, like a debate. Um, uh, you, you probably know people don't get convinced with debates, right? Because when you are in a debate, you're starting to argue with the person even before they finish their sentence, right? Your mind, you're like, you're like protecting your turf. You're not, oh, with none of us, I'm not saying you, we are not open-minded in a debate. We are, we are in a defensive mode. And what the illusion of explanatory depth does is instead of attacking people, we say, I'm on your side, 
just help me understand how this work right so so uh, because of that and then once people try to understand how it works they realize for themselves that they're not that clear about their opinions so for example um i don't know if you if you know but but there's lots of people in the u.s who think the elections in the last presidential election were stolen so um you can go to these people and say i'm not arguing with you but just help me understand how were the elections stolen what exactly happened right uh, wh where does it happen in the process like somebody changed your things i mean and all of a sudden when people start describing it they realize that they don't really understand how election works in general and don't understand how the elections were were stolen and and what they do is they all of a sudden become a little bit less confident and once people become a little less confident that creates the opportunity for uh, attitude change then we have personality personality is fascinating but but because our time is limited i would i would skip it for now and then the last component is the social component and that's another component that we have a lot a lot of things that we we can do um so the first thing in the social component that is important to understand is ostracism and the idea of ostracism is that a lot of times uh, we unintentionally are pushing people that have different opinions away so uh, i'll just admit to my own sins uh, but in the past with i had people who had opinions that i thought were ridiculous i sometimes use the phrase uh, what color is the sky in your world now to me that sounds a little funny to them that was quite offensive slightly i can see um, how it could be offensive much much more than i intended right much more than I intended there's a, okay. there's a symmetry okay. there now what happens when people get ostracized what happens when we laugh at people for their ideas or we even make small small fun of them they are basically pushed to find a community that agrees with them and gives them love and and i'll give you one one example in one of the there was one guy who posted something about me he described in details my crimes against humanity uh, he thought that i was the chief conscious architect that was trying to get people to be obedient uh, during uh, the covid pandemic and he described my my crimes and then he said that there will be um Nuremberg trials 2.0 right in which people would be judged for their crimes against humanity and he predicted that i will be stand on trial and he asked his followers the question of whether i should get uh, life in prison or public hanging and and about a thousand people responded now if you looked at the responses they were so positive uh, not not about me of course they were positive to this guy they congratulated him on his insight and writing skill and how um, uh, thoughtful he was there were there were lots of emojis with hearts and hugs and all kinds of things like that now if you just looked at it you would say these people joined forces to you know to solve poverty <laughs> to to do something good like why why were they so positive again it's not for nothing in the same way that the the misbeliefs come to answer a need these are people that feel rejected from society and what they have done is created a community that is incredibly positive to each other and they need that positivity and um, so that that's what happened anyway there's a couple of other um, uh, social factor but maybe i'll just mention one so there is a term in from the bible called shibolet okay and um this was this is a term there were two tribes that were very fighting with each other and they pronounced the name of the plant in a different way one of them said shibolet one of them said sibolet so i would walk around and i would see you and i would say how do you call this plant yeah. and if you said it the way i do i would say okay you're one of us give you a hug 
if you say it the way that the other tribes is saying it, Sibolet instead of Shibolet or the other way around, I chase you away or try to kill you. Now, <clears throat> this term we're using to signal the idea that when I ask you what is the name of the plant, I don't really care about the name of the plant. I care about your identity. Now think about this general discussion and ask yourself how many people say things that have nothing to do with the truth, but they have to do with signaling their identity. So, so for example, when I, uh, <clears throat> when I was trying to get to Israel after October 7th, I, I flew through London and my flight was canceled. I mean, British Airways canceled the flight. Um, so I, I went and I saw the, the, the pro-Palestinian demonstration. And, and there were okay. people who were calling to liberate Palestine from the river to the sea. Now, what these people were actually calling was the annihilation of Israel. Now, do they really mean it? A few people, maybe. But I think the majority of people are not saying, let's, let's now kill uh, 10 million people. Uh, uh, for this, I, 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 anyway, I, I refuse to believe that that's what they meant, but, but nevertheless, they, they were saying it, I think, as a signal of identity. Or in the U.S., there are people who say, oh, there's no such thing as gender. Or there are people who say uh, Trump won the election. I mean, there's lots of things that people say that is more of a badge uh, signaling of identity than a claim about about the truth. And, and the problem is that the, the moment you have speech that is about identity and not about the truth, it's confusing. Right? So when somebody says there's no such thing about gender, what, do they really mean it? Or do they say it for signal? It's a very different interpretation yeah. to do yeah. it. And, and of course, with social media, people have to say extreme things because otherwise nobody notices. Right? If I just say, oh, you know, gender is a really complex topic. How many people would, would, would follow me or say, oh, yeah, yeah. that's right, that's right. So, you, you, we, yeah. so, so the nature of our conversation in terms of identity is becoming more and more intense. And uh, by the way, think about Brexit. How many, how many discussions about Brexit were thoughtful and informed and how many of them were identity-based? And then there's a vote. Right? After so little information, how, so little thoughtful information has been yeah. passed, uh, people end up voting about identity rather than about the real topic. And um, COVID became an issue of identity. Well, I guess some people might believe those, some people might believe that there's no gender, though. They might actually think that that's the truth, regardless of, of, of the identity politics. It, it could be something that they believe to be philosophically true. So I would say that um, in the beginning, it's almost never the case. Right. So, so when, when people utter something for the first time, uh, they, they usually don't really mean it. But then, of course, after people say it many times and defend it and so on, uh, they, start, they start defending it. But, but it doesn't mean that it's built on their true beliefs. They just start, pretend, they just start defending it in a bigger and bigger way. And, and after defending it, that that becomes more of their, their stand. But if you broke it into pieces, it's not necessarily that what, what they believe. That was a really interesting discussion on belief, and I'm just going to move it on if that's okay with you, just since we have a little bit of time left. Sure. I want to talk about irrationality in general. I loved your book, um, Predictably Irrational. Um, one of the big bits that I particularly liked that stuck out to me was the way that you apply behavioral economics to traditional economic theory. I did economics only at a basic level when I was younger. And supply and demand, and the law of supply and demand, less supply means more demand and so on, is something that's taken as an absolute given. And with your discussions around anchoring and how, how we supply can affect demand, you've kind of destructed that, deconstructed that simplistic binary. And I just wanted to ask you whether you had any other interesting ways, I mean, homo economicus is, is another good example, any other interesting ways in which your work has deconstructed standard, what's taken as standard economic theory? Yeah, so, so you know, look, um, th there's a real question of how do we think about economics? Is it a view with some validity or is it explaining everything? 
And uh, the moment you think it explains everything, then you start using it as a tool to build the world. You say, oh, let's build companies this way, and let's build school system this way, and let's do taxes this way, and let's do... I think economics is a wonderful field. I think it has lots of insights, and they explain part of the world, right? In the same way that, um, you know, no, no science explains everything. So economics describe a, a sliver of reality. And my objection is not so much to people studying economics, it's to the modesty of saying, yes, I understand economics, here is what it implies, but it's only a part of the picture, so let's not take it as if it's the whole, it's the whole picture. And, and because sometimes people take it as the whole picture, uh, we go ahead and we create all kinds of systems that are actually not in our, <coughs> not in our benefit. And if, if you think about human beings compared to economic models, economic models, for example, don't have emotions. They just don't. Mm -hmm. People just compute everything, long term, without any mistakes and so on. But, but they don't have emotions. And, and emotions, of course, are not always bad. Uh, we get to fall in love. We get to have empathy to other people. We, we help people and so on. Uh, but there are also uh, ways to get us into real real trouble and and for me like it's 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 hard to ignore <laughs> the irrational nature of of reality so take something simple like texting and driving in the US there's some states that have laws against texting and driving uh, what do you think happens to accident rate and death rate uh, when these countries states uh, create these laws about fines very sadly, accident rate and mortality rate goes up. Why does it go up? Because instead of texting over the wheel, people start texting under the wheel. <laughs> people are trying to avoid okay. the fine rather than avoid killing other people and, and injuring them. So that's an example of, of when we have an overly simplistic view that says, oh, the moment you'll have fine, people would be less likely to do it. Mm. We'll solve the problem. You, you actually end up creating more damage than, than benefit. Yeah, I mean, you talk about this idea of irrationality in your book, and it's interesting. I think one, one experiment which stood out to me is this idea of something costing, so a medicine, for example, costing 250 pounds created this placebo effect compared to something costing uh, 50 cents. But, but my, my question was, is this really irrational? Wouldn't, wouldn't you say that money is a good placeholder for value? So why is it irrational to assume that something costing 250 is more valuable? So let's, let's be clear. When you say something is rational, you say it's always good. You don't say it's a generally good indication. So, so, so let's, just, let's just be clear about this. Rational means making the right decisions all the time. It doesn't mean here is something that I do and it works in 55% of the time and not in 45% of the time. So whether something is in general a good strategy, like um, let's say um, take, take any strategy that you want, if it's good statistically but not good for each individual, it's not rational. Okay. Right? Because like, you know, if, if you... Let, let, let's say that we say, oh, you know, um, <clears throat> let, let's just keep on with um, uh, texting and driving. You say, oh, you know, sometimes uh, answering a text while driving uh, gets you to <laughs> respond. No, but surely, surely money, money, the money thing is 99% is of the time. Something, a piece of bread costing five pounds is obviously going to be better than one pound most of the time, no? Almost 99%, I would say. So, so I'm completely unsure um, I, I don't know, for example, if you looked at the area of women's cosmetics, but yeah. that's, a, that's, a, that's one that is quite, quite bizarre. Um, there are things with wa wine, of course, and, and beer. Uh, prices are, are unconnected. <clears throat> you know, for example, um, Portugal. Uh, they say they produce amazing olive oil. Uh, can't, can't compete with the prices of Italy. Uh, there's lots of examples for this. I, I don't know what is the right percentage, but 
I, I'm willing to accept that if you had something that was true in 99%, it would get close to being, uh, to being okay. a good strategy. But, <clears throat> but it's, it's not. It's not. Um, and, and with medication, it, it's an interesting story because m medication, the, the price and the quality are often disconnected. Right? The price have to do with market power and competition and all kinds of things and not exactly with, uh, <clears throat> with value. <clears throat> so let me tell you a little story about wine. So I have a friend that has a vineyard. Um, and when I, was, when I was 45, <clears throat> I spent a day with him. And we talk about wine and how many people can detect good wine from not so good wine and, and so on. And then he gives me a bottle of wine. He, said, he says, Dan, uh, this wine we picked when I, Dan, was 30. And he yeah. says, um, and, and that they got a hundred perfect score from Parker, the wine, the American wine, a famous tester from this. And he told me that he wanted me to keep it until I was 50 and then drink it, which I did. Now, imagine drinking that wine without his story or with his story. So here's a bottle of wine. I consume it when I was 50. And imagine one version of me just found this bottle of wine and drank it. One version got it, got the story that was picked when I was 30 remind me of the day that I spent with Bill, kept it for five years. This wine was amazing. How much of the amazement came from the taste buds and how much it came from the story? Sure, but do you, I, I don't think, it's not, it's not irrational. That's not rational, is it? Why, why would that be rational? Because, because it's not about any description of the outside world. It's all about our inside emotional system and the rational framework. I think, I think there's a question of what is rational and what is logical. And I think you're kind of okay. doing a little bit of, of both. Rational in the economic sense is, is not necessarily logical. Like you uh. say, oh, I see a friend crossing the street, uh, an old lady wanting to cross the street, I want to help her. Okay. Can we find the logic for this? Yes. Is it rational? No. It says, I'm going to spend time helping this older lady. I might be risking a car running over me. I never meet her again. I don't know her. Why would I do this? So rational, not everything that is logical is rational. These are, these are different topics. But the rational agent in economics is a selfish, emotionless, all potent in terms of thinking agent. So, so if I help the lady cross the road, maybe in the future that's gonna, someone might see me and it might lead to more benefit for me, no? That's right. If, if, you, if you add anything that is about a long-term interaction, then you would do it. But, okay. but here's some things that very much confuse economists. If you're in a city that you don't plan to go back to, why would you ever tip in a restaurant? Mm, okay. Uh, why would you ever vote? Your vote will never change the, the election. So. There's lots of things, look, the, my first book is called Predictably Irrational because people are predictable. And there's a logic to what we do. It's just not the standard economic logic. So uh, maybe, maybe one last example. Um, imagine you have a friend who wants to open a restaurant. Would you advise them to open that restaurant? The answer is no, you should say no. Most restaurants fail, people lose lots of money and so on. Okay. As a society, do we want to live in a world where nobody opens restaurants or startups? Of course not. At the individual level, uh, people who do startups and uh, spend time on research and uh, try to change the world are doing very illogical things, very, very irrational things. But we should all be very grateful uh, okay. to them. Um, so, so humanity, thankfully, is much more interesting uh, than than the economic model that they just capture one yeah. uh, one aspect of us. 
but so that's why I'm not against economics. I'm just against using economics as a building block for society. I want that when we create rules and policy and so on, I want us to, to think about the, uh, the broader set of human motivation than the elements that are uh, naturally plugged into economics. Brilliant. Uh, I mean, thank you, Dan. I think, I think what I can, and Oli and I can take out of that is that maybe rationality is not such a bad thing. And, and if Oli and I now take this podcast to the next stage, try and really put some money into it, maybe, maybe it's irrational, but maybe, <laughs> maybe it will be better for society in the long term. Um, I'm, I'm aware that we're unfortunately running out of time, and there's, there's loads of things you wanted to touch on, like especially your exper- very interesting experiment on, on arousal. Uh, however, it seems like we're, we're, we're running out of time here, but Dan, I'm, I'm, uh, the sun, the sun is coming. So, so now it's, it's getting, <laughs> getting to be morning. Um, I'm happy to join, uh, another time. Hopefully at some point we'll get to do it in person. Yeah. I'd love to do this in person. Um, and, and we just wanted to say as a closing note, we're, we're sending our, our thoughts out to, to, um, to the people there in, in Israel, in Palestine that, that hopefully the conflict can can soon come come to an end with as little deaths as possible. Yeah, actually, I I I, I uh, you know, as somebody who spent three years in 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 hospital, you know, people think about the dead, um, the injured. In the in- uh, yeah, yeah, very very well. Tough. Yeah, um, it's a that's a somber note to end on, but we we really want to extend our, our gratitude to you for for joining us today. It was a really interesting discussion, and and for all of those who who are listening. Definitely pick up Misbelief by Dan Ariely. Some fascinating topics in there. And we hope to do a part two of, of, this, uh, of this podcast again. Dan, do you have any concluding thoughts? Um, no, you know, I, look, I, I, run, I run my life uh, looking at where are we underperforming on our human potential. Mm. And uh, it's about how we spend our time and our money and... Uh, uh, trust and health and the end of life and 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 the, the biggest the biggest place I think where we could do so much better and we're really terrible on is is the topic of hate mm. and the, the sad thing is that I don't know what we can do like you know the, sadly that the solutions to hate are to to know people from the other side in a very intimate way and it's just very hard to to create but it, it's one of those topics that we we have made very little progress, very little progress on. But uh, it's uh, something we have to we have to get going on. Hopefully, hopefully we can, as a society, work towards reducing hate. And and I think your work is is helping is helping people um, to make more positive changes in their life. Anyway, Dan, thanks again for joining us. This has been the Loaf Podcast. Signing off.